All righty, folks, welcome. It is 12 o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, if you'd like to share where you're joining us from, please feel free to drop that into the chat. We'd love to hear from you. So thank you uh, so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Um, this is the second of three webinars we are hosting this fall. If you haven't already, you can register for our December webinar. It's on celebrating new plant discoveries. And you can also watch our past webinar recordings at ntbg.org backslash events. And I'll be dropping that link into the chat shortly. We'll be announcing our spring webinar series this winter. So if you'd like to be kept in the know and aren't already subscribed to our monthly science and conservation newsletter, Go Botanical, you can sign up on our website and I'll drop that link into the chat shortly as well. This webinar is being recorded. We'll be sending the recording out to you in the next few days. Throughout the webinar, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat box. Uh, we're also going to be holding a general Q&A at the very end. We'll try to get to all your questions, but if we don't, please feel free to follow up uh, with me via email, which I'll also drop into the chat in a moment as well. We're hosting today's session from our Botanical Research Center, as well as our Limahuli Garden, both on Kauai. I have with me Dr. Nina Ronstead, our Director of Science and Conservation, who will now tell you a bit about today's session. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome to all of you to this webinar. We're so excited that you were able to join us today. And with this new series of webinars, some of you may already have attended the first one. Uh, we want to invite you behind the scenes to meet the people who are leading NTVG science and conservation work. Hawaii's flora is really unique with most of the species found nowhere else on Earth. And this is due to millions of years of isolation. However, our native plants and animals are currently threatened and more than 130 plant species have become extinct in the last 175 years alone. Luckily, there's a lot more awareness of this challenge today, and we are working together with many other partners across the state to help stop these extinctions and restore our native forests. And this series of webinars will zoom in on the many different aspects of this work. At the World Conservation Congress that was held in Hawaii in 2016, it was for the first time recognized officially that our biodiversity and climate crisis is best solved together with the local communities and indigenous people who are living and managing uh, in the majority of most of our important natural ecosystems. They also offer an understanding of a more balanced and sustainable use and management of our resources, which is grounded in traditional land stewardship um, practices and ideas. And we are proud to say that in Hawaii, it's one of the places where these traditions are thriving and showing great results as an example for the world. Today, we'll hear from NTVG's uh, curator of living collections, Mike DeMotta, the director of Limahuri Garden Le One and conservation and operations manager and ecologist Uma Nagendra, what they shared with the world again this year at the World Conservation Conference in France that was held in September. There were more than 5,000 international participants on site and many more attending virtual. Um, so today we'll give you um, a specialized version of what they presented there. Hope you will enjoy it and thank you. Thanks, Nina. So uh, Mike Demoda, our uh, curator of living collections is going to go ahead and be our uh, first presenter. So go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Nina and Amanda, I appreciate it. Um, and aloha, everybody. This is Mike Dimoda, Curator for Living Collections here at the National Tropical Botanical Garden. All right, so uh, my presentation today is taken from the talk I gave on September 5th at Central Stage B at the World Conservation Congress in Marseille. In this, I'll present some of the ways we acknowledge and incorporate traditional Hawaiian understanding of their place in the environment and what we can do to restore ecosystem function and services as it was in previous times. Uh, to start with, this image is of the mountain called Ha'upu on the southern shore of Kauai. Uh, the reference that I've written refers to the entire summit region as being the realm of Laka, goddess of hula in the forest. 
kawawakua ka nohana o laka makio leva i ka oho o ka piko o haupu. The sacredness of summit regions is a theme for all of our summits and all of, on all of our islands. Sorry, I'm having a, a little problem advancing right now. Uh, Amanda, I'm gonna try and share a different Sorry, it's not advancing. Let me try this one. Oh, no worries, feel free to try that second one. And while he's doing that, I just wanna say welcome everybody. I love that we're seeing folks from all over. We got some people from Alaska, um, some folks right down the street at LALA. Welcome, welcome. All right, this looks like it might work. So, Eo Hawaii ne na papa na wakea u au i kupo. Here the words mean our islands are of Papa, Earth Mother, and of Wake. Our islands were born of fire. This dynamic, nat dynamic natural force is Pele, the goddess of the volcano, and one of the Kiniakua, the multitude of gods in the natural realm. Then the islands were shaped by water. Hawaii's volcanoes grew tall enough to disrupt the northeasterly trade winds and cause them to release the moisture they picked up in the North Pacific and drop that moisture as rain, and on our highest peaks as snow, Hawaii has some of the rainiest spots in the world. The Hawaiians' understanding and appreciation for the forces of, forces of nature and learning how to live as part of the environment comes from thousands of years of exploration throughout the Pacific. The Polynesian voyages were the most epic journeys of discovery in the history of man. Over about a 4,000 year period, they discovered and settled all inhabitable islands within the Polynesian Triangle which are spread out over 10 million square miles of the Pacific Ocean. The Hawaiians are fully aware of the importance of what we now call the watershed. In Hawaiian culture, it's the Wauakua, or realm of the gods. This pool of water is called Waialeale, -ale, translates to rippling waters. It is at the summit of Kauai's one big volcanic mountain, also known as Waialeale. -ale. This is the Pico or center of the island and the source of the abundance of water found on all sides of the island. You can see the rivulets streaming away from this pool. The ancient Hawaiians understood this as a symbol, as the source of life. In the Kiniakua, Kane was the highest of the four major gods. Fresh water is his kinolau or physical manifestation. We embrace the ancient wisdom of our ancestors and apply this wisdom as biocultural approaches in conservation. Maintain the Wawakua to ensure the water resources for the island. Water from Waialeale, -ale, the peak of Kauai, was acknowledged as the primary source of water for the island of Kauai, but the next highest peak is Kauai Kini, which means multitudes of water. I am humbled by our ancestors' wisdom and scope of understanding of the ecosystem of the islands. They understood the importance of maintaining and enhancing ecosystem function, beginning with the source of water. A heiau, or temple for offerings, was built very near the pool called Waialeale. -ale. Ava, Piper Mythisticum, an important canoe plant that was brought to the islands, was offered here in regular ceremony to Kane. Ava is also a kinolau of Kane, ensuring and acknowledging the paramount ancient god associated with fresh water would have been important to sustaining the relationship with the gods and nature. This is Hanalei Valley, about 300 acres of irrigated taro and a main source of this important staple food. Imagine large tower growing areas all over the islands where streams and springs could be tapped for irrigation water. We can't be sure how many Hawaiians landed in these islands when they first discovered them in about the 12th century, but there were an estimated 600,000 when Captain Cook arrived in 1778. Highly efficient agricultural practices that did not have any negative effect on the ecosystem was how this was achieved. NTBG's earliest conservation work began with extensive and legendary fieldwork led by Ken Wood and Steve Perlman. 
They discovered many new species and rediscovered many thought to be extinct. This required extreme field botany te techniques uh, reaching as much of native habitat as possible. Documentation helps with informing us on the current known range of native species and creates a snapshot in time. Detailed plant descriptions help identify species. The Conservation and Horticultural Center in Lawai'i Valley is where we grow native plants and ferns from spores for ex situ collections and restoration projects. We have a great responsibility of growing the rarest plants from Hawaii. As an example, Alula or Brigamia insignis is a species our garden has collected and grown over many years. It was found on the windward slopes of Kauai with uh, a, a different but similar species found on Molokai. It is believed to have been moth, poll been moth pollinated, but since the plants weren't producing seed, it was thought that the moth no longer existed. NTBG field botanist Steve Perlman is pictured here hand pollinating flowers um, on a plant that, that existed at Mount Haupu. And because of his efforts, seeds were produced and collected. Plants still exist in botanical gardens uh, collections as a result. But the absence of the native pollinator, along with other factors, have caused the wild population to con continue to decline in numbers. Today, there is just one known Brigamian cygnus or alula left on the Napoli coast of Kauai. And if you look carefully, you'll see it right there. This is a rare endemic hibiscus found in Limuhuli Valley and evidence of the in insects that depend on it. Uh, the species of hibiscus was believed extinct until its rediscovery in 1977. Since we don't know all the plant and, and insect codependencies, it is vital vitally important for us to do what we can to conserve and restore native species to maintain ecosystem function. Uh, the squiggly lines uh, in the leaf on the bottom right image is evidence of a native Philodoria micromoths leaf miner caterpillar. The importance of, in, in the restoration of ecosystems is also the impact it will have on Hawaiian culture. Ancient stories and chants often refer to plants, birds, and insects. Aloha aina, or love for the land, is a common theme in Hawaiian poetry and metaphor is employed with birds and flowers used to represent people. Restoring habitat allows for the restoration of ecosystem function. This promotes cultural bio, natural biodiversity, which is important to our culture. The richness of Hawaiian culture Ancient stories and the lessons they teach depend on the continuity of nature and our native biodiversity. Full ecosystem restoration must include traditional wisdom. Hawaiians and their culture are really inseparable from the environment they live in. Hawaiian language newspapers are an important source of traditional knowledge and wisdom that is becoming more important as people learn to understand Hawaiian and more newspapers are translated into English. This documentation has helped us understand uh, the links between the kiniakua, the multitude of gods, and our responsibility to our natural world and our place in it. These printed resources are important because the stories are told in, an, in a native Hawaiian context, in a, in a Hawaiian language speaking world, with a Hawaiian perspective and not a Western one. This difference in view is very important to note. And by the way, there are the equivalent of 100, over 1 million pages uh, of printed Hawaiian language publications. At our Limahuli Garden and Preserve in Haena on the north shore of Kauai, we have areas of the valley that are remnants of the ancient sustainable agroforestry system. These ancient archaeological sites give us insight on how the, our ancestors learned to work uh, with the environment. There, are also, uh, there is also knowledge and wisdom that we can get from Native Hawaiian communities. This island, Ni'ihau, is privately owned and still occupied by Native Hawaiians who still speak Hawaiian as a first language. Engaging with native communities like this is vital. Traditional land and fisheries management, known to us as ahupua'a management, is still in practice in some areas of Hawaii even now. As we move forward, we must continually document these practices in the modern age as forward-thinking Hawaiians did when the written language first came into use 200 years ago. Mahalo nui loa, ho'omoka ike. Thank you so much, Mike, that was great. Uh, so now we're going to head over to Limahuli Garden and the director over there, Lei Wan, is going to tell us a little bit about uh, Limahuli and her history there. Aloha. Can you hear me okay? Okay. We sure can. 
All right. <laughs> Aloha. I'm going to actually start off first with a chant that comes from our area of Kauai, an old one written by the famous Vahine Keolipa, talks about the beauty of Haena and welcomes you into the embrace of Kapoli Lawai. I um, offer this chant via my son, Hanalei, and he will be presenting. <clears throat> Kapoli laua e ka ua aloha, ama kana ho i e hii po i nei, hii po i a e ka wai a māu, ka maka ni kaulana o ka aina, ua like a like me kana loa, me ka wai ani ani o ka pala e ma e ma e i a pua o ka ina ina, i a le i maka e hi a ka malihini, I ini ka mana o e i ke ai, i ka poli ka ublana o ka aina. Poli o kili o e ka ue ano i ai, po o pulu i a nei e ke hukai. A ka iho i a o a i ke maka na kupa ka ulana o ka aina. Ha i na i a mai ana ka puana, o ka lihi lihi o ka poli laua e e e. Aloha, mahalo Hanalei. Aloha, I'm Le Wan, the director of Limohuli Garden and Preserve, one of five national tropical botanical gardens in the world. Limohuli is tucked away on Kauai's remote, remote North Shore. Kauai is one of the eight major Hawaiian islands in the Hawaiian Island Archipelago. We, the National Tropical Botanical Garden, have the honor and privilege of stewarding nearly a thousand acres of this ahupua'a from the mountain to the sea. Limahuli is one of the most biodiverse valleys in the Hawaiian Island and in the Hawaiian Islands and arguably in the world. It is home to dozens of endangered endemic native Hawaiian plants and birds found nowhere else on this earth. Our, our unique uh, garden and preserve rests on the footprint of our Hawaiian ancestors. And as is as if they tendered this place just yesterday. The archaeological sites in these valleys range from 400 to 1200 years old. Our organization, as I mentioned before, stewards and manages this valley from the highest peaks to the outer reefs. In Hawaiian, we have a word for this type of management, and it is ahupua'a. The ahupua'a system can, or ahupua'a can be the word also to ex explain the watershed system. This replica of Limohuli Valley um, in pre-colonial times shows how the ahupua'a was previously tended. If we start from the top of the ahupua'a, you have the portion of the valley we call the Akua or the realm of the gods. These areas were reserved for the gods. Few people, people ever entered these areas or lived in these areas. And if they did, it was for specific reasons and extreme protocols were applied. The Vaunahele or Vaulaau is the lowland forest. In this area of the forest, our Hawaiian ancestors tended to the resources within them. They found ways to balance the biodiversity of both Polynesian cultivars and native Hawaiian plants and native Hawaiian ecology. The Vau, uh, Kanaka, and Kula Plains were areas of the Ahupua'a where most people lived and currently live today. These Vau, these Vau Kanaka or Vau Kula were zones of the Ahupua'a that were highly agricultural. So if you see my cursor, these are the um, Vau, Vau Kanaka and the Kula Plains down here. These areas were highly agricultural, but again, a balance of biodiversity existed in each section of the Ahupua'a. 
Although the Ahupua system was something started years ago with our ancestors, it is still a practice that we use in management today. We steward our resource, resource and resources in Limohuli with this as our guidance. What is important to understand about the Ahupua system, whether today or in the past, whether mountain to sea, no portion of the Ahupua could stand alone. Each zone complemented each other and helped with the overall health of the watershed. Helala au no kumu is an old wise and poetic saying that literally means I am the branch of the tree. The deeper and more metaphorical meaning of this is I'm the keeper of traditions. I follow in the leaderships of the leadership of my ancestors. I am an extension of those who created me. This photo here you can see was of Ha'ena in the early 1900s. So almost resembling the photos in um, uh, the replica. All right, for me as the director of Limohuli Garden and Preserve, Helala Aunoku Kumu. I am truly an, ex an extension of my ancestors before me. In this photo on the left, you can see my Tutu Hailama, who I'm told was a Konahiki of Limohuli Valley during colonial change during uh, the end of the 1800s into 1900s. He was responsible for gathering over 38 families in Ha'ena to claim communal lands, which would become the Huikuai Aina, later transferred to conservation land and Limohuli Garden and Preserve as we know it today. A few years before becoming the director of Limohuli Garden and Preserve, my family had me go through our family Le Palawa ceremony, a ceremony that transfers leadership in the Valley of Limohuli from one generation to the next. Just to kind of go back again to Hailama, my tutu, um, and a bit more about his leadership in this valley. Um, Hailama was an early example of biocultural conservation and early ahupa stewardship. In the early 1900s, a photographer took the only known photo of Hailama's home. Hailama's home reflected some of the old architecture of that era. He built his home off the ground in order to dry his papala wood under the home. Papala or Shakrantera is a native Hawaiian endangered plant that once grew in abundance in the Mahuli forest. My grandmother spoke of how he would tend to the forests of papala, how he would check on them and make sure that they were tall enough for harvesting. He never would gather too much, he would gather just right. He would backstore them under the house as as they were ready, as they were ready to harvest. He used the wood to do a ceremony called oahi. Oahi means to firebrand or to do fireworks. He would use this ceremony, he would do this ceremony from the top of Makana during significant times of the year when chiefs or chiefesses would come through the valley. Makana is a mountain in our valley with sheer cliffs. He would use the art of kolopali to climb to the top. When he got to the top, he'd wait for the night sky to fall. He would light a fire and light the papala wood. Papala is hollow on the inside and burns quickly on the in, uh, on the out, sorry hollow on the outside and burns quickly on the inside. He then would call the winds. Some say a wind he would call was a kehau wind. The winds would listen and he'd start the fireworks show. And for a moment in time, um, so what many would often refer to this as because of the ad admiration for the Oahi bearer, um, they would talk about um, the love of a, a Oahi bearer and referred it to a lot of poetic love stories and so forth. But my grandmother would say um, it was really also about showing how man and nature um, for a moment in time could, could, could become one. Papala or Sharpentera is just one of the hundreds of examples of rare plant species that we work hard to preserve here at NTBG. It is, a tr it is truly the reason and the meaning of biocultural conservation. It shows how species can hold the key to pres preserving our cultural practices. Here at NTBG, NTBG we make a space for 
Western research, science, conservation, and cultural practice to meet. Our seed labs now hold over 14 million seeds in our seed bank. These are key species to our Hawaiian and tro tropical ecosystems and culture. Our efforts do not end there. Like Kailama and the many ancestors who attended these valleys and their biological and ecological diversity, we work hard to preserve this in a 21st century capacity. We combine traditions with 21st century skills to maintain our ahupua'a, from herbarium specimens, to living collection curator, curatorship, to field research, to rare plant collections, to drone and GIS mapping, to makahiki ceremonies, hula ceremonies, and so much more. Our teams of scientists, biologists, botanists, ecologists, educators, Hawaiian practitioners, technicians, administrators, and, and TBG staff work so hard to maintain biocultural practice at its finest. Our efforts do not end there. <laughs> um, once as a little girl, I asked my grandmother what the meaning of limohuli means. And she said um, to me, turn your hands to the work. And I believe our staff here at Limohuli truly do that when it comes to biocultural conservation. Mahalo. Wow, Le, thank you so much for sharing. That was very beautiful. So our last presenter today before our open Q&A is Uma Nagendra. So I'll go ahead and let her introduce herself and share her screen. Here we go. Aloha, everyone. Let me pull up my screen here. So Leigh and Mike have taken us through a fantastic journey um, around Kauai and the Hawaiian Islands and Limuhuli in particular, looking at um, the biocultural connections there. Um, so the very basics of biocultural conservation has to do with just that, the connections between the biological and cultural aspects of our world. Um, biological, we think of any living thing, um, pretty much any non-human nature and cultural, any part of human society. So underlying all of biocultural conservation, no matter what aspect you're doing, is the idea that these two components of our world are connected in many ways. Um, Leigh and Mike have already gone through a couple of them specific to um, us. Um, but go ahead and write in the chat. I want to wake people up a little bit. What are some ways that you see um, biology and culture connected for you? Go ahead and write in the chat if you can. Ooh, yes, absolutely. We have to, we all eat plants. And I, I always think of plants because I'm in botany, but there's non-plant food as well. So yeah, everything from the essential and crucial for survival, like food, shelter, medicine, water, clean water um, is a part of, of uh, the connection between ecology and culture. How many of us like to decorate our, our houses with plants and images of nature? How many of us like to enjoy a hike outside and, and the view um, of a beautiful nature nat uh, natural setting? Biocultural conservation incorporates all of that. Everything from the absolutely essential for life, food, shelter, water, to the more recreational and, and pleasurable, like recreation and um, um, adornments.
a lot of conservation already acknowledges that people need conservation for our own well-being and health, our own food, shelter, and water. But we often forget the flip side, that those cultural connections that tie human society to the natural world are what fuel long-lasting, sustaining, and meaningful conservation. Oftentimes, these take the, take the form of things we don't even call quote-unquote conservation because it's so baked into the culture itself. You think about an endangered plant like papala um, that Lei talked about, or a not yet rare plant like olona. These are both native plants that are tied to specific cultural practices in Hawaii that have been in decline for a long time, whether because they were prohibited or just the practitioners um, haven't been able to pass on their craft. When that practice gets lost, so does the knowledge of how to care for and cultivate and tend those particular plants, as well as the energy of the people who are actively caring for those plants um, in their own home gardens or in the forest, um, keeping them free of weeds, keeping them safe from climate change in their gardens and natural disturbances. And this is around the point in the conversation when we start thinking, okay, this sounds really important and really nice in theory, but how do we actually do this in reality? And thankfully, there are people all around the world who are practicing biocultural conservation um, and are writing down what works. So we can turn to the literature, um, which then you have like lists upon lists of potential things to work on. Um, so we'll pull out just a few, a few key concepts and take a look at what we aim to do in Limahuli Preserve as an example. So that includes Biocultural conservation acknowledges that conservation can have multiple objectives and stakeholders. It tailors interventions to the social ecological context and prioritizes partnerships and relation building for conservation outcomes. One of the most universal themes in biocultural conservation is multiple objectives, stakeholders, and goals. This is not exclusive to biocultural conservation as a practice, but it's kind of a necessary first step to realizing and fulfilling the many roles that the land and organisms we are conserving play in ecology and community. For instance, Limahuli Preserve plays at least five different roles in the ecology and community of North Shore Hawaii. It's certainly a refuge for nat native endemic plants, um, of the 286 native plant species that have been documented in Limaholi Valley, over 13% are listed as endangered. Um, 11 of these are in critical need. In addition to endangered plants, Limaholi is also home to two species of endangered seabirds, uh, Newell shearwater or a'o and the Hawaiian petrel or ua'u. These are seabirds that were once plentiful and are crucial contributors to nutrient cycling. Um, but now that their populations have plummeted, um, one of our objectives is to preserve their habitat and keep them safe from predators. Just as important as the endangered plants and animals, of course, is the endangered culture. Um, the valley itself is the primary source of information about its previous stewards. Cultivated plants, stone walls, historical trails and drainages, these are all living references so another objective is to maintain this reference information in place and practice the skills and arts so that they continue to live as well. In Hawaii, a vahipana is a name for a storied place where significant events have taken place. And Limahuli is certainly one of those. It holds stories from the beginning of the world um, as well as stories from the height of the Hawaiian kingdom and even maybe five years ago. These are all important stories to keep going. Um, and as long as we continue to have people active in the valley, we will be continually creating more stories to share. And of course, we must always be aware of the valley's role as an ecosystem service provider for all downstream communities. We have the privilege of actually working from the top of the mountain nearly all the way to the ocean within a fa fairly remote residential community especially as the climate changes, bringing with it floods, landslides, and droughts. 
we want to be able to help maintain fresh water, erosion control, and flood protection for ourselves and our neighbors. So all of these objectives coexist throughout Limahuli Preserve, though we're not working on them simultaneously in the same exact locations and times. But by embracing all of these roles that Limahuli plays, we're actually able to utilize more of the Valley's strengths, which gives us more opportunities for success. One of the biocultural principles that I think actually helps us achieve these multiple objectives is focusing on tailoring the interventions to the social ecological context. What is the social ecological context? Um, so the social context is people, their values and the needs that they have. And the ecological context is the landscape itself, its condition and its needs. So if we're in a rangeland in the Western US or a cityscape or a rural community, depending on where we are, both the people's needs and the landscape's needs are going to be different. We happen to be on North Shore Kauai. So that means we're starting with the Ahupua'a system that Leigh and Mike have already talked about. Um, this is a self-sustaining social ecological unit containing all the materials needed to survive and maintain a healthy ecosystem. As you can see in this artist rendition of Lunghuli in the past, like Leigh mentioned, people are active in every part of the valley to varying intents and purposes. What we learn from this social ecological history is a proven method of landscape management for multiple objectives. By using a gradation or patchwork mosaic of land use types, um, depending on what the landscape and the land form actually is, with high intensity agriculture in lowland areas and wild mountaintops providing ecosystem services to the rest of the valley. So here's a GIS map that shows one potential imagining of the way that the Ahupua'a of Ha'ena containing Limuhuli might have been divided um, historically. You can see the different colors indicating different uh, areas of the Ahupua'a. But we are a thousand years later. So you can write in the chat and brainstorm a little bit. What might be different between now and a thousand years ago? There are different plants here for sure. We have a lot more invasive plants, as well as we have a lot of cultivated plants. We're using different systems to bring water in. Yeah, we have different technology. The climate is changing. That is really important to, to think of when we think of how um, things are different between now and the past. There's different humans around with different values as well. Absolutely. A lot of invasive species, there's pollution and many other challenges to, to, to think about. And the reason I bring this up is because when you think about the social ecological context, it's not only about the place you're in, but also the time you're in. Um, we're not aiming to replicate this exact map or necessarily use the exact same tools, but to emulate the lessons that it has shown us using the tools that we now have as well. Like Leigh mentioned, we now are able to use things like um, drones, um, seed banking, um, you know, even things like uh, earth movers and tractors. So we want to emulate the type of zonation, zonation and patchwork mosaic that this map demonstrates. I'm gonna let my programs freezing. There we go. For instance, we have the uppermost part of the valley, which is only accessible by helicopter, is still maintained um, as the most intact wild ecosystem that's critical habitat for extremely endangered plants and animals, as well as the foundation of all ecosystem services downstream. Um, in the middle part 
of the lower valley. We mostly maintain this um, to, uh, as rare plant populations, as well as clearing and trimming for flash flood mitigation. Further down in the valley are dedicated restoration areas where we remove invasive species and actively cultivate native species habitat for conservation collections. And in the lowland areas, these focus on more intensive human use, including food production and public facing conservation education. And all of this is only possible when we prioritize partnerships and relation building for conservation outcomes. Um, many times this is viewed as looking for quote unquote buy-in from the community. Um, and I prefer to think of it as actually becoming part of the community itself. And as like Leigh talked about, this starts with the actual people who take care of Limuhuli Valley, when the leaders and decision makers themselves have strong ties to the place, whether through family lineage or lived experience, there's a genuine connection that's truly irreplaceable. Being part of the community does make our conservation activities more effective. For instance, invasive ungulates like pigs and goats, I think we all know, can wreak a lot of havoc on native ecosystems. And fencing is a proven method of protecting critical areas from the animals, but Fences are also controversial as they are physical and symbolic barriers to humans who might also have an important connection to the place. But by including neighborhood hunters in the fence design process, we were able to build a fence that better addresses both rare plant and community needs. The local hunters know pig movement pathways the best. They know where pigs go and when. Um, so with their input, the final fence design ends up to funnel pigs into pinch points that makes it easier for hunters to catch them while also keeping pigs out of the designated restoration areas. Science is another important aspect of conservation activities to further our conservation programs, um, but it, these relationships can turn sour if there aren't appropriate boundaries or understanding. We are working on establishing a community research agreement to make sure that all research conducted in the Valley is mutually beneficial because as it's at its best, Science programs can build capacity within the community, um, can help answer relevant local questions because the community is curious about what's going on um, and equitably share both findings and credit. The big take home that I want everybody to, to get at the end of this though, is that by following biocultural principles, we're actually able to improve our conservation programs. We have more opportunities for success whether it's saving a rare plant or keeping a cultural practice alive, by embracing the connections between plants and people and adapting to new socio-ecological realities, we're increasing our resilience to ongoing global change. And by being an active part of the community, especially the family lineages tied to the valley, this keeps our conservation running long-term, far beyond the lifespan of a grant or contract. Mahalo, thank you for listening and allowing us to share the biocultural approaches that we take in the Mahuli Valley. That was awesome, Ua. Thank you so much. So we're going to open it up to general Q&A now. So feel free to drop your questions into the chat box. We did have some come through our Q&A feature over here. So uh, Sherry was curious about what the names of the rivers or streams are in Lumahuli. I can help to answer that. Our main body of um, stream is Limohuli, although we have sections of the stream that have particular names, like for instance, um, not many people know this, but a uh, name for our family, for the area known as Cold Pond, um, that, that section of the pond was a deep pond that actually was below the road before, um, before the road was put in, and it was called Hawa. It was a family bathing pond. Um, so if you wanted to use a, a proper Hawaiian name for Cold Pond, you could use the word Hawa and you will hear some people from our family call it that. Um, but if you go down to some of where this, each spring has a name, so example being, um, if you go down the road 
um, I won't tell you where, you have to go with someone, um, a Koopa of the place so they can share with you the appropriate way to gather or be in that space. But there's a place called Kamealoha. And um, although we've probably lost a lot of names in the past, part of our work in conservation is to preserve those names because they tell you a little bit more about the place itself. So Hawa meaning icy place, the icy cold place. And you can expect to find like the creatures that can survive in, in colder waters in those areas. Um, the spring down the ro road by Aloha um, is a spring that um, something about it brings Aloha to your, your kino, your body. So just a little something. Thank you so much. Uh, Sherry was also wondering, she had a few questions about how are animals becoming extinct and how have natural disasters hurt or killed animals in Lumhuli? I'll take that one. I'll start with the natural disasters. Um, the natural disturbances in uh, Limahuli Valley or in Hawaii in general, um, while an individual disaster or disturbance like a hurricane or a landslide um, might not um, kill an like a animal in particular, um, with all of the endangered species that exist in Limahuli Valley, um, sometimes these plant populations only exist on a couple of cliffs or a few valleys, um, which means that a hurricane can actually wipe out um, half of an entire population. Um, and this has happened, we think, with Alula, the plant that um, Mike talked about, Vercamia and Cygnus. Um, and there's another uh, plant, Cyania kuiheva, haha, um, that is its Hawaiian name, um, that was described from Limahuli Valley right before Hurricane Aniki. And then it actually survived Hurricane Aniki, um, but, it, but with the influx of invasive species that happened afterwards, um, it did not survive that um, environmental change. Um, although thankfully it has been re-found in a neighboring valley, and we're very happy about that. But that brings up the idea that even if the natural disaster that disturbance doesn't um, actually kill a plant or animal, the change that it sparks um, can be very detrimental to endangered um, plants and animals. In general, if we're dealing with an ecosystem that's already pretty resilient, natural disturbances are part of the cycle of ecology. But here in Hawaii, we have so many other stressors, including climate change and invasive species, um, that natural dis disturbances can kind of tip things over the edge, unfortunately. With animals becoming extinct, the seabirds in particular that are in the upper valley, they're threatened by um, a lot of invasive uh, animal predators such as um, feral cats, rats, barn owls, um, as well as uh, um, they are very attracted to light um, in the night sky. And so sometimes they will run into things or fall down in the road um, as they're flying. And then now is actually the season that they're flying around. So a reminder to please um, keep your lights dim at night because the seabirds are trying to get home. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Thank you. And we had another question in the chat from a different uh, Sherry. So she was wondering, how do you share back what you have learned? Is it with true engagement with the stakeholder groups throughout a project or is it sharing back at specific reporting times? Um, so more from you to others. Can I uh, have a little input on this one? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the, the, the true answer is yes to all of the above. So we engage with our communities um, uh, as much as possible. There are, there are activities that are in, in all of our gardens that uh, community members that we are in direct contact with are made aware of. And you know we actively get them involved um, to be able to participate. Um, 
I think I speak for everybody, as, especially as curator, to say that <clears throat> our, our collections are not necessarily museum pieces that you can only look at and, and not touch, although the rarest plants we, we protect very closely. But, um, you know, our canoe plant collections, our taro and sweet potato and all, all of the canoe plants, um, they are as much a part of the Hawaiian culture and the Hawaiian people as anything else. And we, on the South Shore, where I work more regularly, we bring in school groups regularly to plant sweet potato and help harvest taro and, and all that, because it is as much a part of a living culture as, as anything. So, so, yes, I think we engage actively with everybody. And when we are going to do something like a webinar where we want to reach out and share some of our accomplishments, um, you know, we're kind of limited to if somebody's going to read our web page or read our posts on social media, that's the one way that we can reach out to, to as much of the community as possible. So we really appreciate that, that all of you do look at our posts and engage with us uh, through the webinars and all. But if there's ever any questions about, about additional uh, information regarding some of our projects, um, any one of us would be happy to help answer those questions. And you can direct emails to our gardens. And uh, we have mechanisms that we can get the, get the questions directed to the right people to be able to respond. So um, yeah, we, we it's part education and sharing is an important part of our mission, and we actively do all of that. Thank you, Mike. I I'll add just a little bit as well. Um, I think another great way that we share um, everything that we have to look, to teach and to offer is through our volunteer programs. Um, I'm always impressed with how much our volunteers really do and how much they hold um, this organization together, really. I'll give you a good example. I was just with Mike yesterday in our herbarium and um, our South Shore director, Tobias, was sharing that 90% of our herbarium specimens are done by our volunteers and they're, um, they're mounted and properly labeled and everything by our, our volunteers. And that just goes to show how much um, we do try and offer um, education through the volunteer program. So mahalo nui to all of our volunteers out there who are watching. Thank you, Lei. And I dropped the uh, volunteer link in there. And then I'm also dropping a uh, news post we did that features our herbarium volunteers, if you're interested in finding out what exactly that is. Uh, Natalia is curious about um, any recommendations on reconciliation between the revival of hula as an important cultural practice and the over-harvesting of native plants that can occur by halau for hoike. This can happen with Ma'ale, uh, Mokihana, and many others. I, I'll start um, if anybody else wants to jump in in, in a minute. But uh, over the last three or four years, I have uh, offered workshops through some of the local halau hula regarding exactly that topic. Um, and this is not a recent issue. It goes back for many years <clears throat> with uh, with the. Uh, uh, inappropriate harvesting um, in the forest around Hilo for Mary Monarch, for example. So I made it a point to do that. And it's always been for 20 years now, I've been advocating for halau hula to grow their own lay plants, palapalai ferns and maile and ohia and, and all that. So um, we can talk, and especially with rapid ohia death is a big issue right now and getting into ohia forest and harvesting is really detrimental to ohia trees at this particular moment in time. Um, going out and, and doing more outreach and even before uh, Rod started to, to encourage people to be able to grow and make lays out of their own plant material. Thank you, Mike. And we had kind of a similar question from our fifth grade uh, class at LALA. Uh, they were asking, are trees being cut uh, down up Malka? And if so, what kinds and how many? I can, I'll try to take that one. Um, so, 
in the upper part of the valley, way up Malka, the very top of the valley, um, we try not to cut down trees if we at all can. Um, we want to maintain that as as um, intact a native forest as possible. Um, there are invasive trees um, that we do prevent from becoming trees. Ideally, we get them when they're seedlings um, so they don't take over. The most um, trees that are cut down are actually ones that have already fallen or they're in danger of falling into the stream, um, which then clogs up the stream um, and causes a lot of other problems for uh, potential flooding. So the most um, tree removal that happens in the valley is actually flood prevention um, and it's of invasive species as well. That's a lot of octopus tree, um, Schifflera actinophila, um, sometimes java plum, um, sometimes Clusia rosea, that's an uh, autograph tree. Um, but yeah, mostly only trees removed for flood prevention and we try to make sure those are stacked well outside of the flood zone so they don't then come down later. Thank you, Uma. Uh, Julie was wondering, oh, Lay, did you want to pipe in? Go ahead. Well, just to add to that just a little bit, um, and going back to the topic of biocultural conservation, I can say, um, at least in Limohuli and uh, many of the programs that Limohuli and uh, NTBG are involved with, when we do have to um, see a tree fall down for natural reasons or um, for other reasons, whether they're invasive or non-invasive, um, we often are finding a way to use them though and to return them to a cultural practitioner or something like that. Um, so example being uh, a llama tree just went down in our garden naturally and Kumu Hinano um, Lazaro um, took on that tree um, for his kuahu, for his hula halau. So always try and find a, a way to use them even if they're invasive. Thank you. Uh, so Julie was wondering, how can people who are not local to Limahuli help with biocultural conservation remotely? Omo, you wanna you wanna answer that one? I'm trying to think, um, because I, I mean, the easiest way is to come travel here and and um, volunteer in the preserve or in the garden. There's always a lot of work to do, um, which you don't have to have a lot of experience for. Um, everything from pulling weeds to helping us uh, mulch and take care of the existing plants. Um, and then if, if you're unable to travel, there's lots of um, online events, sharing the word, sharing the education, um, uh, uh, educational programs like this one. Uh, and if you've got more money than time, always donating is great. <laughs> I'll just plug that in. Thanks, Uma. Yeah, as, as she mentioned, uh, sharing is really important. So if that's you know sharing on social media or telling a, um, a friend or a family member about you know Limahuli or our work or any stories, uh, that's much appreciated. We really appreciate that. Yeah, and I uh, somebody dropped in membership. Yeah, I'll drop in the membership link as well. Um, that's also a great way to support us, uh, and you get some benefits through membership as well. I will also. Uh, just throw in that biocultural conservation isn't specific to Hawaii or Limahuli. Um, wherever you are, there's connections between the culture and the ecology. So I always encourage everyone to take the lessons um, that, you know, we're trying to emulate that here, um, but you can emulate it where you are. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so Looks like um, Kalaya uh, is asking, have there been projects to gather and document the mo'olelo of the alkwa and cultural practices and connections with the alkwa? Are there existing video materials or being made on this subject? Great question. Um, I, I'm assuming uh, that's specific to Limo Huli. Um, but I can also answer it um, more broadly. 
Um, I think as our um, resources here in Hawaii expand, um, we are getting more and more access to things such as Kaleo Hawaii, which are old uh, Hawaiian recordings of practitioners in the 18 and 1900s or early 1900s mostly um, and their use of, of materials and resources in our Hawaiian environment. But um, as far as Limo, or, and, and we continue to build upon those regardless um, as we grow in technology and so forth. Um, and for Limohuli, I can say um, there has been quite a bit of ethnographical work done in the past um, from some of the elders in our community. Um, there are a number of videos that have been done and shared um, globally uh, of our work out here. Um, but that's something we're trying to uh, progress in and are currently working on something um, to expand that. Well, uh that is all the time we have today. It is one o'clock, but thank you so much for all of your questions. And again, feel free to follow up with me via email uh, if there was something uh, that didn't get answered for you. We'd be happy um, to respond to you that way. So again, mahalo nui for joining us today. Uh, it's really exciting anytime we get to uh, share our work with you. Um, we do have a survey, so if you have any feedback for us, uh, please feel free to fill that out. I'll be dropping it into the chat in a moment. Uh, and I'll also be sending it out in an email along with the recording afterwards. Uh, so just a reminder, we have one more session uh, for our fall webinar series, our December 1st session on celebrating plant discoveries in 2021. So that one will be another fun one. Uh, so feel free uh, to uh, go to our website to register for that one if you haven't already. And thank you again. We really appreciate it. Ohuiho, everybody. Aloha. Thank you, everyone. Aloha.